promise to Abraham, when God made a promise to Deborah, when God made a promise to George, when God made a promise to Jorge, when God made a promise to Bill, when God made a promise to you, put your name there. When God made a promise to Abraham because he could not swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Mm. I don't know why I, I get that when I'm doing this. Okay. God swore by no greater. He, there is no one greater than God. <clears throat> saying, surely blessing, I will bless you. Surely blessing, I will bless Deborah. Surely blessing, I will bless John. Surely blessing, I will bless Tom. Surely blessing, and put your name in there, I will bless you and multiply, I will multiply, I will increase you. And so after he had patiently endured, not God, but Abraham, he obtained the promise after he patiently endured ED, you got to reach the end of it. He obtained ED, the promise. What promise? What God had promised. Now, whatever it is that God has said, that, that word endured means that there is something between the moment you get the promise and the moment you get or obtain that promise. And in between is called the process. Somebody say the process. the process. Now, I'm not talking about back in the day when I was, uh, you know, a young kid. We used to get a process, you know. That was before the perm came along. For, for some of you that are black. It was before. It was a, it was a process. When you look at the old temptations and all of the uh, old artists back there, the old artists, I don't want to say too old, but uh, the, the, the ones back there had a process, and that was the style. That was to straighten your hair, and then they came along with the perm, and then they came along with the curls, and then they came along with, I don't know what they got now. Whatever it is, I'm going natural. He says, I, after you endured the process, he obtained, you obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, <clears throat> and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, more abundantly, God is determined to show you more abundantly the promise the, of, 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 of the heirs of promise, the immutable, immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, it is impossible for God to lie. <laughs> Man, if there's anything you ought to shout on, you better shout on that. It is impossible for God to lie. So if God said you are healed and it doesn't seem like you are, God is not a liar. Somebody better shout glory. It is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong, excuse me, we might have strong consolation who have fled from refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. You see, without deviation, hear me on this, because all of us have plans and there's also in the process deviation. Without deviation, progress is not possible. Progress is not an illusion. It happens. But it's, it's, it is slow and invariably disappointing. And I'm telling you the truth. Our youth needs to understand that. During the process, it looks like no progress is ever being made. Don't you know that? It looks like nothing is actually happening during the process. Progress is made invisible in the process so that the progress can be complete. Because you'll get to the point of seeing a little progress and slow up and lose your momentum. 
because you think something is not starting to turn in your favor and you don't push as hard. The passion is gone. I was taught that the way of progress was neither swift nor easy. So if you're looking for something pain-free and swift, look to go through something long and distressing. <laughs> Glory to God. Learning is a process and it will never exhaust your mind. But worrying, will process, worrying during the process will. It will wear you out. When the Bible says that the, the, that the devil comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy, that first word steal isn't, he's not just coming to steal your car or your house. Let me tell you what he does. He comes with what they call bill worry. Y'all know who that is. His first name is Bill. The second one is Worry. And that worrying over your bills steals your joy. It steals your peace. It steals your sleep. How many of you know it's hard to sleep when you're worrying? Satan wants to steal and rob you of your rest. And he doesn't want you to believe in what God promised. When God promises you something, I don't care what it looks like, God is not a man that he should lie. He's not like others. So you got to get that in your heart. You got to understand what God wants. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal for accomplishments requires a degree of sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. You're not going to get where you want to be without it. It's not going to happen. You don't make progress by standing on the sideline, whimpering and complaining of, about certain things that are going on. You make progress by implementing ideas, making something happen, not complaining about what's not happening. And so it's one of the steps that you got to understand. It's one step at a time, one day at a time, and doing new and different things which makes the journey more plausible. It makes it more believable. So the greatest enemy of progress is not stagnation. It's false progress. When you think something is going to happen in your favor. It starts looking like it's happening in your favor. When God is doing something, it rarely looks like he's doing it. Glory to God. You see, people who live with the delusion that, they, that, that, that they'll be better off seeing some progress to give them motivation to keep going they are sadly mistaken. It robs you of your passion if you start seeing it. Some things you got to know, man, you just got to keep working at it and keep working at it and keep working at it. And then, boom, suddenly. You see, most people think that they should be getting paid immediately after putting something into place. It's, and it's not their fault. Society teaches you that by giving you a, a wage, you work and you get paid. So you don't understand that you got to sometimes go without pay. When you're doing something, you got to sometimes go without getting an immediate return. When you got a dream, it's not about getting paid quickly. Are you hearing me on this? The Bible talks about Naaman, and they were talking about that this morning. I almost said, get off my message. Like the old song that said, hey, you. Get off my mountain. That's my mountain. You got the devil standing on your mountain. Tell him to get off. And if he doesn't get off, put your hands on him and get him off. Glory to God. Second Kings, the fifth chapter, the ninth verse. I want you to turn there because this is a very important passage of scripture that you got to get. <clears throat> Second Kings, the fifth chapter, starting at the ninth verse. It says, then Naaman, now remember Naaman is a captain uh, who's, who's close to the king and he's this man of, of authority. And uh, you got to understand some of the history, but let me go on and give you a little bit of the scripture first. Then Naaman went with his horses because he needed healing. He went, he had leprosy. He went with his, ho went, with, with his horses and chariot and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. Now, Elijah is the prophet. 
He wasn't the premier prophet. He was the premier prophet after the premier prophet had died, which is Elisha. Elisha was the one who served the man of God and got double the anointing that was on Elisha's life. And imagine what God can do when you go to a man of God who has God's ear. You got a lot of people who doesn't have God's ear. They have more of God's mouth. That means God is always giving them correction and telling them to not sin instead of having God's ear so that God can hear them and change conditions in terms of environments around them. And so Elijah had God's ear and they knew to send this man, the king tore his clothes and, and, and because of the condition of his servant and he sent his servant to the man of God for healing. And the man of God, when he heard about it, he said, why did you rip your clothes? He said, my servant, he needs healing. And so he sent his servant who had leprosy, and, it, and Naaman came with this pious, proud look. The Bible says a haughty spirit, a, a pride will go before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. Rest assured, whenever you become lifted up in yourself, it is based on a false sense of security that you think a title or a degree or a rank. I'm telling you, God is not moved by the star on your collar, even if it had four. Only man becomes mesmerized by something so small and insignificant. Those are simple symbols of someone's authority. Are you listening to me? But it doesn't say anything about their character. Sometimes we wear our stuff on our hearts like it, 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 it should make us who we are. But all of what you've done in life, you should never get any accreditation, accreditation from things you've accomplished. It's because of the glory of God or the things that you have, or the amount of money you have, or the success you've had. Because the moment you got it, I can tell you, you can lose it in a moment. And if you don't lose it, you can lose your health. Are you listening to me? Naaman was proud, prideful. And it says, and Elisha, the 10th verse, and Elisha sent the messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. The, the man of God didn't even come out to him. The man of God stayed in his house, stayed in his tent, sent his, 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 his secretary, his concierge, concierge, sent him out there and gave him the word and say, tell him, to dip in the Jordan River seven times. But Naaman, catch this, catch this. He said, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times and be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman became what? Furious. furious. He became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out. He already put in his mind how it's going to work out. Every one of us have plans on how something's going to be done. They're going to come out to me. They're going to do it this way. He said to himself, surely he's going to come out to me because of my status, my position, who I am. And indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. We already have it in our mind. We have a preconcept a preconceived ideal of how it's going to happen. And yet the man of God didn't. Then he said, are not the Amana and the Parfa and the rivers of Damascus better than the rivers of Jordan? Could I, could I not wash in them and be clean? So he returned and went in rage. He's angry. He's bitter. He's resentful because first of all, the man of God did not come out and entreat him. The second thing, he sent his worker who he felt he was better than and that man shouldn't even be talking to him. And then he tells him to go and wash in the Jordan River. Now let me give you a little history. The Jordan River at this time, the water was low and so the water was muddy. I'm going to tell you now, 
women today would love to get mud on their face. Because they got this notion it's going to straighten out their skin. It's going to make them look young. That you, uh, are you listening to me? And yet this man is telling him, go and dip, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. But this man became upset and angry because when you have preconceived ideas on how God is going to do something, it disrupts everything. Hear me, have you ever had a preconceived idea when you prayed about something and you just knew in your heart, God's going to work it out this way and God's going to do this and God's going to give you a promotion this way and God's going to... I got a word from one of the pastors, our pastors that, that's in Phoenix. He said, Pastor, you gave my wife a word that God was going to give her a voice to speak to millionaires and share. And uh, you gave her a word. And he said, we came thinking, oh, my God, this word, we're, we're going to stand. And, we're, and oh, they started adding in things. We're going to be millionaires. We're going to drive up in limos. We're going to do this. And he said. He said, and then, man, we were hit with everything. I mean, negative stuff started happening. He said, we couldn't find clients. He said, and all of a sudden, this lady invited her to go to this event. And there they asked her, can you go ahead and just share? Real, didn't realize that she was sharing with seven women that were all millionaires. She said, he said, it came to pass. But when you go through the process, it's not coming to pass. You're looking, it, it, it's got to happen a lot faster. God, if you don't do this, we're going to die. If you, God, if you don't heal our eyes, we're going to lose our sight. God, if you don't do something, we're going to lose our hearing. God is not concerned about what you lose. He said he's going to do it, he's going to do it. God doesn't care if all of a sudden you lose your eyes. Your eyes, socket, your eyes can be pulled out of his sockets. God can put them back. God doesn't care if you all of a sudden lose your legs. Don't you know there's a man in the Bible who had a withered hand and Jesus grew the hand back? So stop thinking that God is late. He's never late. Whenever he shows up, beloved, believe me, it's on time. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Because he's not a man that he should. You see, the most difficult thing for most of us to do is to follow instructions that don't make sense. Don't make sense. It didn't make sense to go and dip in a muddy river when there was other rivers that were clean. That people are on the beach having a good time. The waters are blue and clear. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense to do something like that. And oftentimes, isn't it funny that you can, always, you can always have your own plan of how something should work out or how you feel something should be done when it's something you can't fix yourself? You can't do it, but you, you figure out this is how it should be done. Do you realize that the problem with most unsuccessful people is not that they cannot be successful, but that they're not willing to do the things that are necessary to be successful? Success demands that you follow a sequence of instructions during the process despite how stupid, stupid it may seem. God told the children of Israel when they wanted to crash and bombard the walls of Jericho, he said, don't worry about it, just walk around. Walk around one time a day, then on the seventh day, do it seven times, but don't say nothing in the process. God is telling you, do it my way or it's the highway. The only thing stupid about the instruction is that a person who remains stuck in the situation that they desperately want to escape from, but they can't, but they won't follow the simple instruction. You see, the Bible says in, in Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, you can eat the good and the land of the land. You got to at least do what God says. It's simple. Don't be, don't be deceived. 
overnight success never really happens overnight. Don't let people fool you. Like, man, I just woke up and there, there was the money. Doesn't work that way. People all judge the outcome, but they never judge the process or the, 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 that's leading up to the, to, to the success. Every success story has tragedy, has challenge or risk, and without these, there could be no real personal victory. My wife and I, we often watch 3030 on ESPN, and out of every single story, every single story of success, there is death, there's misfortune, there's loss, there are challenges, and you say, my God, why does it have to be that way? If you ask over five, uh, you know, five millionaires, uh, what, what would they attribute to their success? Because oftentimes, I, being in business, I've been in business since, 19, since 19, 19, 1982, I've been in business. And I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of successful people during my lifetime. And if you met or spent five minutes with some people that are millionaires, you will automatically see there's a common trait between every single one of them. And surprisingly enough, I've seen that these common traits are shared almost universally in most all successful people that oftentimes they do what people are unwilling to do. You want a breakthrough, but you say, That's, that doesn't make sense. I, why, sh why do I have to do it that way? The unsuccessful will sit and complain and would, and, and would rather abandon their dream than to fight for it. And it's just like I said last week when the, the, the four lepers, why sit here we and die? What is that going to solve? To sit back and do absolutely nothing. When you know the condition that exists and you see the condition that exists and you just got to get in your heart that you got to do something. You got to at least get up and fight for something. There's an old Lucky Stripe commercial, cigarette commercial, that, that sometimes you, you would see the black eye and the person said, I would rather fight than switch. That's in reality, people. That's how it is. It's got to be something that you are willing to fight for and fight through in order to get it. If God promised, that means that you're going to have obstacles and challenges between you obtaining it and God saying it. But God is not a man that he should lie. He is not a liar. He said what he said, and it means it's already done. You just have to get to that place and fight through whatever it is. Are you listening to me? Amen. Go back to 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. Let me pick it up at the 13th verse. After he had this false expectation of how it should be done, his servant came to him. And sometimes you can have people who work for you who really loves you. His servant came to him, came near him, and spoke and said, My father, they called him father, if the prophet, if the man of God had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? Now, see, you got to know the history behind it. Because in those days, in days of antiquity, what happens when, when, when they went to a seer? A seer was considered a prophet. Now, every prophet was not a prophet of God. But they were all called seers because they could see the future. And so when a man of statue of prominence, prominence, prominence went and, and inquired of a seer, a seer would say things to make him look good. So he would say, if you want healing, you've got to cross the, 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 the Euphrates River, climb the Guadalupe Mountains, and then you shall achieve success. And all of the glory would go to who? Go to the one, the captain, because he had to earn what he did. 
And so it will be at times you fight through these men and then your healing will be on the other side. But yet it wasn't done that way. So they said, if he would ask you to have done these great things, you would have said, good, I can do that because it will make me look good when I, when I conquer those things. But how much more then when he says, wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according. Say it again. Say it with me. According. Say according. Because you got to do it directly exactly how God says it, according to the saying of the man of God. And what happened as a result? His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now, contrary to popular belief, you may have heard preachers get up and talk about this. There was no progress within the seven times that he dipped. He didn't dip three times and all of a sudden, his hands started looking new. He didn't dip four times, and he looked down at his feet, and they did too. He didn't dip the fifth time and saw the arms begin to change. He No. Every time he got up, he looked the exact same way. That's why don't judge things on where they are. Don't get so fixated on how something looks. Remember, the progress is in the process. The command was to dip seven times, seven times, seven times. So in order to get your healing, you got to go down the seven time and get up. Because then it will be complete. And it's, it's, it's something you got to get in your heart. It's like when the scripture says when Jesus uh, healed them and, and said, go and, and, and tell others. And as they went, they were healed. What Naaman's servants were saying to him was that you are not the one that is going to get the glory out of their healing. You're not going to do something so heroic and great. God will get the glory by you doing, you doing something simple and uncomplicated, but it will teach you something in the process. Seven times, hear me, seven times, seven di simple dips in a muddy river were absolutely necessary for his healing in, of leprosy because doing simple things over and over again makes things easier that are difficult. Stephen Curry, you think all of a sudden that's a difficult thing? It's easy. Why is it easy? Because he's been doing it over and over and over again. You got to learn how to do the simple things over and over again. Some of you don't realize that you, if, especially for the body of Christ, you can change your circumstances by giving. And this is what the church all of a sudden because they look at conditions and go to their default system and start hoarding. No, no. Jesus said it's simple. Give and it shall be given. Give is simple, isn't it? How do you get seeds? You sow seeds. Who gives you the seed? Who gives you the seed? God gives seeds to the sower. Now, the seeds... Are, is money. He's not talking about seeds of, of a plant. He's talking about money. God gives increase to the ones who sow their increase. So imagine an inconsistent sowing produces an inconsistent result. So don't stop and all of a sudden say, hey, where are my blessings? When was the last time you sowed? 